I am Jerry Candelario. I am Jasmine Creighton. APIT is proud to present My Wellness Journey Starts With Me, a visibility campaign to raise awareness about the importance of mental health and wellness in the LGBTQ2 spirit community. We have assembled a talented group of social influencers who will share their experiences and their personal philosophies on their journey to wellness. Through one-on-one -on -one interviews, they were able to share their thoughts on the COVID-19 pandemic, racial inequality, and the movements Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate. These interviews are meant to spark dialogue and increase awareness to address our community's well-being. Here's the interview featuring the sensational Margaret Cho with our very own board member, Dr. James Simmons. Margaret, just, you know, as kind of a reminder, a refresher, like what, what, are, when did you know it was sort of time to start your journey to, to mental health, mental wellness, and how did that start for you? Well, in my family, we have a long history of alcoholism and abuse and mental illness and suicide. And, you know, it's something that has, hasn't ever been addressed until my generation. And, um, so, you know, because immigrants, at least until, you know, like people my, uh, in my age group, they like, they're like, oh, we don't need help. We don't get help. Like, we don't do that. That's like what white people do, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like, we didn't seek it. And we just live with these problems and just covered them up and didn't do anything about it. And, um, and so, you know, like the, the, um, that, that sort of like, going to get therapy and things like that, that was like, look at, looked at as this privilege that we couldn't afford. So like later, like when I could finally figure out like that I could do it, it was this amazing thing. And, you know, I was really um, lucky to be able to get it. I mean, mine, mine really came out of realizing I had to, because I was self-medicating through mm -hmm. alcoholism, through drug addiction, because it's like when you don't have um, anything in place to try to figure out what's wrong. It's like, you're gonna try to make yourself feel better through drinking, through um, whatever you can at hand. And um, so for me, it was really about like trying to figure that out. And like, you know, going into show business, like I had like, there was like, you know, the success that I had and there's certainly like, there was stuff that I could go to that made sense and, um, you know, like I, I had attained this level where I could sort of manage it and then, um, you know, I love a drama, so I love to get like put away for a time. Mm. So I really like kind of was like, like really had sort of like to crash and burn for a while to really learn a lesson in like, it doesn't have to be so dramatic, it doesn't have to be so crazy. So now I sort of have like a now an understanding that depression and loneliness and all of that is really symptomatic to a kind of thing that like, we can deal with it. It's not like a shameful thing to have depression. It's not a shameful thing to have mental illness that is like something that is um, you can manage day to day that you can deal with. Mental illness is something that everybody has some degree of. It's almost like we're not broken. We are all like human and it's actually like, okay. And it's actually something that we can come to with a sense of like, oh, all right, I can manage this, I can deal with this and keep on going. And so therapy is a part of my life, but it's also something that I keep returning to. Um, I'll like move away from it and come back to it. Um, but it's like, a, it's more, more, more like a holistic system as opposed to like, I don't get to put away in a hospital anymore for a year and a half here, a year and a half there. It's pretty good. Um, so let's just start with, I mean, I feel like everybody has a lesson sort of at this point about what we've learned during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, I was doing my homework as I should. Also, I listened to a couple of episodes last season, but I hadn't, I mean, it just dropped, but I hadn't listened to the first episode mm -hmm. um, of your podcast. 
Um, so I know a little bit about some lessons that you might have learned during the pandemic, but tell yes. us kind of like, what were these lessons? Like, what did you learn in the last year just during this pandemic? during the pandemic how important it is to still remain engaged with the world even though we're in quarantine that there's so many things that need to be done and so many issues that need to be solved that really uh, underscored whether it's racism whether it's homophobia whether it's transphobia whether it's sexism whether it's abuse happening for people who are locked down you know there's a lot of problems that still exist so social media has been really vital. It's been a lifeline for people. I think it's really shown us how much technology can really help us and help us change everything. So that you mentioned technology, and I think it's such an interesting conversation about how we've all stayed tech connected through technology, but particularly in terms of like our mental health and connecting with others, it's not the same. It's not the same to be connected through technology, but it's really better than isolation. And I think really like um, suffering in a lot of ways intensifies in isolation. And so even though we can't physically be together as much as we want to be, there also is a gratitude that I have for times we have been able to get together mm -hmm. and a gratitude for the future of when we will be able to get together. So there's a lot of um, lessons to be learned about gratitude and about finding the joy within in this quarantine. Mm -hmm. I love the word gratitude mm -hmm. from that. So what other positives, right? I feel like gratitude is such a positive that we can all take away from what was categorically a shitty, horrible, awful year, right? So like what other positive lessons can we take from this? Well, whatever is, um, I think, really prevalent in your life really emerged during the pandemic because you really saw sort of a sense of like pausing the world and going within and everybody did that and we had a lot of eruptions of a need for social justice, for change, for improvement, for empowerment. And I feel like, you know, we were able to move along with activism, even though we were shut down. So I was really empowered to be engaged with society and with politics. I got to work a lot with the um, Biden-Harris campaign, and I was really grateful for that. And I think that you know, we have a capacity for change even though we're locked down. Absolutely. Speaking of change, you know, I gotta go there. There, I, I, the hate that's been going on towards Asian Americans, Asian people, period, globally, but particularly in our backyard right now, you know, unfortunately came to light with Atlanta shootings and other violence that's been going on. And you, you've been a very, a long standing activist in this and, and, you know, you're, the article in The Guardian that just came out, you know, um, championed you as a a four woman, a grandmother <laughs> of the fight or whatever. I wasn't yeah. sure it was the best word. It's great. <laughs> it no, I love you. it. I mean, I love that we get to really engage in activism right now. I mean, all of the violence and hatred directed towards Asians during the pandemic reminds me a lot of the first pandemic, which is AIDS. Mm -hmm and how much violence was directed at the gay community around AIDS and a use of violence and homophobic acts in order to justify their own fear. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, with fear, if you're really afraid, afraid of a disease that is spread through blood, why are you violently attacking people you believe have it? Mm -hmm. In the same way that if you're afraid of a disease that you think is spread by Asian people, why would you attack Asian people who you believe have it? It's not, it, it's not a justification. It's a kind of um, an excuse that people use to indulge in their own biases, their own discrimination that was already present before any disease, before any pandemic. It all, already was there. Absolutely. So it was already there. And I liked what you said about how it's it's kind of easy to blame this all on Trump, right? And to point all of that on Trump, but that it's been going on for a lot longer. When Trump is using words like the China virus or the Kung flu, really it's definitely a problem and it definitely makes racism very casual, which is the problem, but it's just a symptom of a larger problem with discrimination that we already have. Mm -hmm.
So I feel like someone, so I identify as black and queer and have had lots of conversations with other individuals about what it means to be not just an ally, but an accomplice um, in fighting racism and fighting, you know, uh, for LGBTQ rights and against queer phobia and transphobia and all of those things. So what, what would you say? What do you say to individuals right now when, when Asian American, violence against Asian Americans is so prevalent? Like, how do we be the best ally, best accomplice? And I, I want to phrase this in, I was very sensitive to when people who were not black came to me last summer during Black Lives Matter and said, how do I do the work, right? I'm, I'm sensitive to that. But also I feel like we have an opportunity to really educate people who can make a difference with this. I think it's wonderful that allies want to come forward and help. And I think it's important for all of us to question the biases that exist within. Just because we're marginalized as people doesn't mean we don't marginalize others. And it's to recognize our own bias. And I think that really helps. Like, I think that um, it's really important for us all to acknowledge that racism exists in everyone. And that once we know that, then we can deal with it. Because when you deny that you have it, then you're denying the problem in a way that makes it invisible and we shouldn't. I'm really grateful that white allies, um, people who are not Asian are coming forward to talk about it in the same way that I think we also in the gay community need to really address our own biases within. Because sometimes when you're gay, you sort of think, I can't possibly be racist. <laughs> I can't possibly, because I'm gay. And it's like, I can't be sexist because I'm gay. And it's, it exists, it exists within our community. And so once we acknowledge that we can do what it takes to take it out. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I can only imagine the the mental health in general right now after a pandemic. Now there's violence and shooting and people are dying right now. So how have you during the pandemic and even now where we're kind of starting to open up, but not really, but how are you taking care of your mental health through all of this? The way that I take care of my mental health through all of this is really to look to action as opposed to being frustrated and being upset about these things that are going on. I look at it as a way to inform my activist side to mobilize and to change. And, and there's ways to do that when we're still locked down. There's ways to do that when we open back up again. And I feel like when we do open back up again fully, we're going to be a better society for that. But mental health is really important. And it's important to recognize your own needs, whatever that is through connection. I have a lot of different ways that I connect to a community that's all about mental health and keeping each other safe. I want to, uh, I, I love this question and I hate this question, so I'm already apologizing for asking it, sorry. Um, what do you say to to baby, baby Margaret out there who, um, I loved when you were, uh, a video recently, you were like, I was coming out for two years, I just never stopped coming out, right? That was, uh, it's amazing, I love it. It's like you, right? So, but what do you say to baby Margaret now, all the baby Margarets out there who are just coming out of a pandemic and the violence that's going on and all these things that are happening for their mental health. What do you say to those folks? For the baby, Margaret, for the baby, everyone's, and the idea of returning to society and coming back into a public world is really that we've had an opportunity to reset, to really think about what we need to change and to think about ourselves and think about our world in a way that's going to make a difference. So I want to invite everybody to really create that change in their lives because that creates change in the world. I love that. Change in the world, 2021. There's a lot that needs to change, but what are you hopeful for this year? I'm hopeful for the end to police killing black people. I'm hopeful for justice in the George Floyd trial. I'm hopeful. The, the hard thing is, is that it's a George Floyd trial. It's not a Derek Chauvin trial. It's like, why are we examining the life of a victim when truly we should be examining the life of a murderer? And we have proof, we saw it, all of us saw it. In fact, the entire world can be the jury here. We know who's guilty, it's not George Floyd. Thank you very much, Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Margaret Cho, and I'm here to talk to you about COVID-19 and its effect 
on our mental health. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've gone through periods of lockdowns and have been isolated from many of our support systems, which in turn can be especially hard for people going through depression and other mental health disorders. The LGBTQ community are also especially vulnerable to the negative mental health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, as physical isolation may worsen feelings of social isolation and other chronic stressors relating to their identity. According to the National Alliance on Mental Health, the relapse and overdose rate has increased by 30% since March 2020. In addition, worries such as COVID-related stigma, homelessness, and unemployment are also contributing factors in the increase of our collective anxieties. If you find yourself struggling, feeling hopeless, or depending on alcohol or drugs to get through the day, don't be afraid to seek help. You don't have to deal with this on your own. Help is just one call away at APAIT or on the 24-hour NAMI helpline. Together, we will get through this.